we starting off tonight's lesson just ultimately understanding that um you know in the time of unleavened bread it's a time of of, of reflection right it's a time of introspection and just really self-examination and and unleavened bread is really a beautiful time to just celebrate as it helps us to really it's a reminder of what we should be doing daily in our walk with christ right um a beautiful thing about it is you know it just it just really makes practical some of the things that are happening in the spirit for us and just really it's a it's a solid reminder because i don't know about y'all um but one one revelation that my wife has shared with me earlier this week is just you know the understanding of why the scripture says to remove the leaven from your house right so we know that different people do it different ways. Different people have different, you know, some people will literally throw it all out. Some people will prepare leading up to unleavened bread where they know it's coming and just abstain from purchasing anything so that way there is none in their house and basically just consume what they have before unleavened bread starts. And some people, um, depending on the different situation, whether it's just uh, personal reasons, financial reasons, or different things like that, might just set it to the side until the unleavened bread is over. But I'm sharing that to say, um, my wife was kind of looking at the aspect because there are certain things that when you're you're hungry, you're about to go prepare your meal and you're about to go eat, you know, you get to this point where it's like, okay, let me double check the ingredients. Let me make sure what I'm about to consume doesn't have any leaven in it. It doesn't have any yeast or any other type of like rising agent in it. And, um, and so as she was kind of checking the ingredients on some of the things, you know, there's a couple of, there's a couple of items that we realized had leaven in it that we didn't realize had leaven in it. And one thing that she was explaining was uh, what the father had revealed to her was just the aspect of, you know, it makes sense why it says to remove all of the leaven from your house. Because if you think about it, whether you realize it's there or not, even if it is there, depending on, depending on the situation, you know, there's always opportunity where it can become a point of temptation, right? And so it's this aspect of removing the leaven from your house. It's, it's interesting because it's like you don't want to accidentally you know what i mean consume something that has leaven in it and at the same time you don't you don't want to be tempted into like willfully doing it right so i'm, I'm laying it down as an aspect of just understanding of how that ties into temptation so we can understand why the bible tells us to abstain from certain things right it doesn't necessarily mean some of the things that the father is calling us to abstain from is necessarily sin in itself However, when he looks at it, he sees how it can be an open door for the enemy to tempt you either into uh, a sin with uh, just based on ignorance and not understanding that that is something that's displeasing to the Most High God. Or also just a sim the situation of you can have something within your life that, that is contained, that contains something that is an aspect of sin or something that is displeasing to the Father. And you don't realize it and because you don't realize it, you're consuming it, right? So that's where we get to the scriptures that talk about abstaining from like the very appearance of evil and different things like that and and other stuff but that's just like a small testimony and just kind of like a revelation that my wife had called earlier this week that she was sharing with me and i thought it was beautiful so i wanted to share it right um but yeah so as we get into tonight's leaven as you guys see the title of this lesson is leaven of heaven right and we're coming from we're standing on first corinthians 5 and 8 where it says therefore let us keep the feast not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. All right. So I'll go ahead and pray us in and then we'll just jump right into it. All right. So Heavenly Father, Lord, we come before you. We just thank you for bringing us through another week. Father, we just thank you for your divine providence, your protection, and just um, your strengthening us, Father, in our times of, of need. Father, we thank you that you are a good Father. Father, we thank you that you are righteous and you are just. Father, we thank you for just all things that you do in our life, Father, as you continue to purge us, prune us, and purify us. Father, we thank you for the good times and the bad. Father, we thank you for the times of affliction which perfect us. Uh, Father, we thank you for the trials of faith which build our character. And Father, we thank you just for the, the, the various testimonies that we have that build our trust and our faith in you. Father, I pray that you will just bless tonight's lesson. Father, that you will just allow your spirit to speak through me. Father, let me not share anything that's of my own own wisdom, Father, but only let me speak what your spirit desires to be spoken. Father, I pray that you will prepare our hearts to receive the implanted word. And Father, that you will just um, break down any false strongholds, Father God, uh, any misunderstandings, let them be broken. Father, any distractions, let them be bound up and blocked even now. And Father, just let these things all be done for the name, uh, for, for the sake of your glory, Father, that we might be edified in order to edify others. Father, we ask you for all these things and we receive it by faith in the name of Yeshua Christ. And we thank you. All right, so. 
Starting off, who are we? We are Seven Seal Remnant Ministries. Um, our mission is supporting the work of the Most High God of Israel and gathering the remnant in these prophetic days. You can learn more about that in Ezekiel 11, Jeremiah 23, and Micah chapter 4. We're diverse, multi-generational, global, and virtual church community, united with the purpose of spreading the doctrine of Christ and the gospel of the kingdom to unify believers in spirit and truth. We are established on biblical truth, purity, and accuracy, pursuing the true heart of the Father to bring the church on one accord. Our purpose, um, we believe that it was prophesied in these last days that the Father will pour out His Spirit on all flesh and that the gospel of the kingdom must be preached to the ends of the earth. We believe this gathering that we see to be the outpouring of what the Father says it is, the harvest of the remnant. We're a middle ground ministry that bridges the gaps of faith and doctrine as believers seek to understand core principles essential to faith in Christ. And our vision is simple, is gathering the remnant, restoring the faith, and unifying believers. All right, so some main points that we're going to talk about today, we're going to talk about this happy feast, right? This, this beautiful time of joy. We're going to talk about the leaven of the Pharisees and examine that a little bit and see what the Bible says. We're going to look at the concept of this new leaven that we have from heaven, this new leaven of which we celebrate 11 bread with now at this time. And then we're going to look at this concept of circumspect faith and then also understand a little bit more about examining ourself. All right. So happy feast, right? Beautiful thing about 1 Corinthians 5 is this is in the New Testament, right? And I like to I like to emphasize this because a lot of a lot of times you know we will be discouraged from celebrating the holidays of the Most High that we find in the Scriptures, just because a lot of times it's often presented to us as though it's irrelevant or doesn't matter. So I like to highlight this part where it says, "Therefore, let us keep the feast," right? Which shows us that the early fathers and the early believers, you know, they they were still doing this. But the beautiful thing is it it explains to us how we ought to keep the feast now, right? So as we're walking according to the spirit behind the letter, right, we understand that everything that we do in the natural is a reflection of what happens in the spirit. So 1 Corinthians 5, 8, it says, Let us keep the feast not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. All right. We're going to look at that a little bit more later, but I just want to encourage everyone that is celebrating that, you know, we're doing what the early believers in Christ did. You know, the Father honors the celebrations when done in truth. I know we often hear about the scriptures where, you know, we, sometimes it'll be quoted in where he says, you know, I don't I don't have a pleasure and your Sabbaths, your new moons and your feast days and different things like that. When when the Most High said that, he was talking about when individuals were doing it in pure, right? Like their hearts were, were not right before him. They were full of idolatry and every other thing to the point where he was like, it's all tainted, so I don't want to deal with it. But that does not mean he does not honor or appreciate or desire us to 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 celebrate these days that he gave us right that point to him is just he's he is a way that he desires us to do it and ultimately it's with purity uh purity of heart which is basically what's uh highlighted in first corinthians 5 and 8 right um the, the the last point with this aspect is just you know i encourage you to continue to build on christ with the truth you receive and just understand that the more you walk in what the Father is showing you and, and, and how he's trying to show you how to walk it out, the more you are grow, uh, the more you grow and are solidified in your walk. All right. That being said, let's look at the leaven of the Pharisees. All right. So we're coming out of Matthew chapter six and we're going to be reading verses five through twelve. All right. Matthew chapter 6, verses 5 through 12. And the scripture says, And when his disciples were come to the other side, they had forgotten to take bread. Then Jesus said unto them, Take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. And they reasoned among themselves, saying, It is because we have taken no bread. Which when Jesus perceived, he said unto them, O you of little faith, why do you reason among yourselves? Because you have brought no bread. Do you not understand, neither remember the five loaves of the five thousand? And how many baskets you took up? Neither the seven loaves of the four thousand. And how many baskets you took up? How is it that you do not understand that I spoke it not to you uh, about the bread, that you should be aware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees? And verse 12 says, Then understood they how he bade them not to beware of the leaven of bread, but of the doctrine of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. All right, so this passage is an important passage when we're talking about this, this heavenly leaven, right? When the scriptures are talking about, you know, keeping the feast, not with the old leaven, 
But with the new leaven, right, we, we got to see how the scriptures kind of start to, to stack on top of each other and how the precepts line up with one another, right? So we know that there's a spiritual component when 1 Corinthians 5 and 8 talks about not serving with the leaven of malice and wickedness, right? And then we also see that Christ himself was explaining to his disciples to beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, ultimately breaking down this concept of the doctrine that the Pharisees and the Sadducees were teaching, right? So we, we, we can see some core principles already with how it's lining up and just the, some of the significance that we see within this aspect of how it is we should be keeping the feast when we keep it, right? So understanding this leaven of the Pharisees and this concept that Christ presents to us and then understanding how Paul kind of expands it a little bit more in the leaven of Pharisees, then let's look a little bit more. Let's look a little bit more to, to, to see what's going on, all right? So jump into Matthew chapter 23, and we're going to be reading this whole chapter just to kind of look at and see exactly what this doctrine of the Pharisees is, all right? So... Matthew chapter 23, verses 1 through 12, it says, Then spake Jesus to the multitude and to his disciples, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. All they tell you to do, observe it and do it, but do not do after their works. For they say and they do not. For they bind heavy burdens and grievous to be borne and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move with one, them with one of their fingers. All their works they do to be seen by others. They make broad their phylacteries and enlarge the borders of their garments. And they love the uppermost rooms at feasts and the chief seats in the synagogues and greetings in the markets and to be called of men, Rabbi, Rabbi. Right? In modern English, we would call that like pastor, pastor and all the other stuff, right? Verse 8. But be not called Rabbi, for there is one who is your master, even Christ. And all of you are brethren. And call no man your father upon the earth, for one is your father which is in heaven. Neither be you called masters, for one is your master, even Christ. But he that is greatest among you shall be your servant. And whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased. And he that humble himself shall be exalted. Continuing on. In verse 13 it says, But woe unto you scribes and Pharisees, right? This next passage, we're about to start to look and see a, a, a lot of aspects of what is the doctrine of this, the, these Sadducees and these Pharisees, right? So verse 13 says, But woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites! For you shut up the kingdom of heaven against men, for you neither go in yourselves, neither do you suffer or allow them that are entering to go in. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites! For you devour widows' houses, and for a pet pretense make long prayer, Therefore you shall receive the greater damnation. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites! For you can pass sea and land to make one proselyte, and when he is made, you make him twofold more the child of hell than yourselves. Woe unto you, blind guides, which say, Whosoever shall swear by the temple, it is nothing. But whosoever shall swear by the gold of the tem temple, he is a debtor. You fools and blind, for whether is what is greater, the gold or the temple that sanctifies the gold? And whosoever shall swear by the altar, it is nothing, but whosoever swear by the gift that is upon, he is guilty. Verse 19, you fools and blind, for whether, what is greater, the gift or the altar that sanctifieth the gift? Whoso therefore shall swear by the altar, sweareth by it, and by all things thereon. And whoso shall swear by the temple, sweareth by it, and by him that dwelleth therein. And he that swear by heaven, sweareth by the throne of God, and him that sitteth thereon. Verse 23, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites, for you pay the tithe to mint and anise and cumin, and have omitted the weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy, and faith. These you ought to have done and not left the other undone. You blind gods would strain at a gnat and swallow a camel. Verse 25. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites, for you make clean the outside of the cup and of the platter, but within they are full of extortion and excess. You blind Pharisee cleans first which is within the cup and platter than that on the outside that it may also be clean. Woe unto you scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites, for you are like unto witted sepulchres, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but are within full of dead men's bones and of all uncleanness. Even so you also outwardly appear righteous unto men, but within you are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. Right? And in verses 29 through 33, 
It says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites, because you build the tombs of the prophets and garnish the sepulchres of the righteous, and say, If we had been in the days of our fathers, we would not have been partakers with them in the blood of the prophets. Wherefore you be witnesses unto yourselves, that ye are the children of them which killed the prophets. Fill ye up the measure of your fathers, you serpents, you generation of vipers. How can you escape the damnation of hell? All right? So, Christ said a lot in this chapter, right? He said a lot. And we're, we're going to break some of it down. But before we break it down, I actually want to let to kind of help us understand and look and see what this, this leaven is, right? So, at the very core of everything the Messiah was just saying, he basically, you a lot of word that he, the, the one of the main words he talked about was hypocrisy. He talked about hypocrisy and iniquity, right? So the root of all of that that you'll see is, is ultimately pride, right? So when Christ is talking about the doctrine of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and he's talking about this leaven in, in, in this aspect that we see, then we can understand that it deals with pride because pride ultimately leads to hypocrisy. Right. Pride ultimately leads to sin. Like all sin is rooted in pride. Right. Hypocrisy is rooted in sin. Right. It's 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 it's, un it's unbalanced weights. It's partiality. Right. It's partiality between sin It's partiality between others and different things like that. Right. And we know that with the father, there is no partiality. Right. There is no unjust scales and there is no hypocrisy. So those are some things that he, he doesn't really like right the scripture says this it's in abhorrence to the most high god right that means it's like a strong strong hate that the father has for hypocrisy pride and sin right um but when we look at the definition of like a hypocrite as defined by the lexicon and the concordance there's two there's two definitions that came up right so on one definition we see this aspect where it says it, it deals with an actor under an assumed character or a stage player Right. And it also says it also means to be soiled or like soiled with sin. It means impious and just ultimately like to be hypocritical. Right. So what this tells us is when the scriptures is, is breaking down this concept of, of hypocrisy and different things along those lines. What it's telling us is that a hypocrite, as defined by the scriptures, is someone who is basically acting the part, but not really consumed with the character or they're not really living the attributes of what it is on the inside it's just they're putting on a show right they're putting on a show right the other aspect that just deals with with them putting on a show because ultimately in their heart they're soiled with sin right and that's typically where you see a lot of partiality and i'm not talking about this i'm not talking about the concept where individuals are growing right because we know the grace of the most high allows us that space to grow as we're walking and we're seeking and we're learning and understanding as as his spirit leads us and guides us into all truth and all righteous right and all righteousness ultimately though what it's talking about is talking about that aspect of like well how the scripture says in first john like the one who knows to do good and doesn't do it to him it is sin right so basically the scribes and the pharisees these are individuals who knew the law they had written the word like the scribes they were the ones who understood how to write so they were writing the holy text right and then the Pharisees, they basically were like the, 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 I would just, I would compare them to like police officers, right? They, like they enforced the policy. They upheld the law, if that makes sense. So what Christ is basically saying is they know better, but they don't do better. They know the right thing to do, but they don't do it because in the core of their heart, they're wicked. They're self-centered. They're self-focused, right? So they will, it's, uh. It's, it, think of it this way. Ha, imagine being pulled over by a police officer because the speed limit is 70 and you're going 75, right? You're going five miles an hour on the highway and you get pulled over and you get a ticket just to get back on the highway and drive at 70 miles an hour. Maybe you put on cruise control or something like that to make sure you don't mess up again. And then the same police officer or state trooper that just pulled you over for speeding comes zooming past you. They don't have their lights on. They're not going to pull somebody else over. Like, and I'm talking about a, a straight stretch of road. They're just, they just zoom past you. Right now, you're still on cruise control. So you're at 70 miles an hour. And for like five minutes, you just see them get smaller and smaller ahead of you, which lets you know that not only are they going faster than you, but like just they're just they're just they're speeding themselves. Right? It's hypocritical. It's like you're gonna try to enforce the law on me, 
but you yourself are an offender of the same thing that you're trying to impose on me. So that's that aspect where the father is breaking it down. And he was like, or Christ was teaching us, he was like, don't be like that. Because that's the point where you are putting a, a, a heavy burden on someone else that you yourself are not upholding. Right? You're extending grace to yourself, but you're not extending grace to another. And that's a burden. Because the grace of the Father is given to us to strengthen us and enable us and help us in our times of weakness. That's why the scriptures say where sin abounds, grace abounds, right? When we fall short, the mercy of the Father is given to us and we have that time where we're strengthened and comforted by the Holy Spirit to get up and continue walking on, right? And as someone who's full of, of hypocrisy and, and, and pride in the very things that the Most High is displeased with, right? This, this leaven that is supposed to be put out of our life Right, will come off and, and basically deal with an individual in an ungodly manner that ultimately cripples their faith, discourages their, their willingness to yield to the Father, and it pretty much breaks them down. Right, And I'm not talking about rebuking or holding someone accountable so that way they understand that there is a standard that we live by Right, and encourage them to, like the scripture talks about restoring one another in the faith. I'm talking about like Basically, they, they're stoning them with their words to the point where they have just killed this person's faith. They just killed this person's desire to even congregate a fellowship. And they've killed this person's passion and heart to even seek the Father. Because they just, they just presented a God that is not a proper reflection of what the Scripture says. Alright? So, I want to backtrack so we can kind of break down some of these passages real quick. But before I do that, I want you guys to think about like, uh, it's a scripture that I forgot to put in here, but it's one that was laid on my heart when I was preparing the lesson. But just that aspect of like, you're thinking about how when we come into the season of unleavened bread, right? After Passover, the blood of the lamb on the doorpost, death has passed over us. We transition into newness of life, right? We've been set free from bondage because the father looked down, he saw our pain, he, he heard our cries. And he also desired that we would be free from our bondage to come and worship with him, right? Or to worship him and serve him in spirit and in truth. This aspect of, of, of being delivered and crossing over and dealing with the unleavened bread, we know that we're getting rid of our sin and different things like that. One example that the Father had brought to me was the same way we cleanse out our temple. Like you have to understand us. Think about how... Christ did when he walked into the temple and saw everything that that basically was was not what it was supposed to be Right, it said he braided the little cord. He started whipping them. He flipped tables. He kicked them out the temple Right like like the leaven that they carried the spirit that they carried the doctrine and what they were doing and how and how they were Carrying it was something that was impure and it was defiled So the father just basically you could look at them as leaven. He purged that out of his temple Right. And so the same way that Christ was a physical example and showed us what that looks like in the natural, we understand that that's what the father desires us to do in the spirit. Right. So when we come to Christ, those things that are in our life, right, those things that we're watching and that we're listening to and all these different things like these sins that easily beset us or these things that we know have nothing to do with the father and ultimately will not allow us to continue to grow and be purified, but will basically cause us to be reminded of our past sins and basically different things like that. There's leaven in our lives that the most high desires us to get rid of. Right. And that could look like anything. But the beautiful thing about unleavened bread in this season that we're in as it deals with like examination and I don't want to get too far ahead as far as like the lesson of different things. But I want you to just kind of see the purpose of this season of unleavened bread and just really all of it is just that introspection like father show me what's in my life that doesn't belong. And this is something that believers in Christ need to do all the time all the time. Right. When we first give our life to Christ, like, think about it. There's a lot of people like I've been doing this long enough where I've seen a lot of individuals. And when they first get to Christ, there's like a, there's like a such a spiritual purification that has happened where it's like there's like this. It's like a baby, like this, this innocence. Right. And they're like, man, I don't want to do anything that's outside that's, that's going to bring displeasure to the father. And depending on what's around and different things like that, a lot of people sometimes you'll see get drawn back to what they were brought out of. Right? Because the enemy does not want to let you go. Pharaoh let Israel go. And then turn around and pursued them. Now this is the thing with the, this is the thing with that story. Right? The Father above delivered Israel through the Red Sea and consumed their enemies. 
right? But to, the the very thing that he that he set them free with uh, through, like he brought them through the water. The very thing that was a barrier is what he used to. He made a way through the barrier and used that same barrier to destroy the enemies, right? But this is this this is the catch with that. Had Israel not moved forward and following the Father through the Red Sea, they would have been consumed in the in the very place that they stayed at. They would have either been consumed by what the Father used to consume the enemies. Or they themselves would have been brought back into captivity by the same thing they were just set free from. It happens all the time. It happens all the time. Believers in Christ get set free from a lot of stuff. And the Father will show them the way that he desires them to go. And they'll be afraid. Because they don't know what it looks like in the wilderness. They're afraid of being alone. They're afraid of being ridiculed. They're afraid of being uncomfortable, right? And all of it comes just from a failure to trust the Father because you got to remember, like, when we're in bondage so long, we forget what God looks like. We forget the testimonies. We forget what he's done before, right? So we might hear about certain things from, from like, praying grandmothers. And, like, 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 I hear a lot of times, especially within our generation and the generation behind us, just always to talk about, like, the older saints. and did, Like, we knew how God was with them and different things like that. But that same God can still be with us. The Most High does not change. And it's interesting because we'll, we'll, we talk about how much we saw him with the older generations, but we don't look at why he was there. Right? The level of purity was different. And I'm not, and I'm not saying that to, to kind of puff them up or like tear anyone down. I'm saying that so we can understand that somewhere the enemy put leaven where it wasn't supposed to. Because he says a little leaven leavens the whole lump. Right? So somewhere an enemy crept in. To get us where we are now. And the whole purpose of the enemy doing that is to bring people back in the bondage of what they were set free from. Right? So as they were set free, we know ultimately the father desires us to bring us to a place. Right? And the reason he desires to bring us to a specific place is because once he sets us free... And breaks down those enemies Then we know at the end of the day Ultimately We can be free to walk in newness of life We can be free to walk by the spirit We can be free to worship him Right But when he brought them to the place to worship him Right He had to deal with that He had to deal with that purging process That cleansing process Right He had to get that leaven Right, so on the way to Mount Sinai, when they received the commandments and different things like that, they went through that purging process where he was reminding them that he's trustworthy, that he's faithful, that he is their provider. Right, he had already shown them a lot of stuff in Egypt, but they started complaining and forgetting about that already, right? So sometimes the Father, he will take us through a season where we're not sure what's going on, but he's teaching us to trust him again. Because they have forgot what it looked like to trust him. They have forgot that he's trustworthy because they forgot who he was. So... Not only was he teaching them that, right? And we see that once we come to Christ, like he takes us on his face where he's there literally doing everything, right? And he gets us to a, to a certain point and he's like, okay, boom, I've gotten you here. Here's my word. This is what I need you to do, right? And it's not a salvation thing because he already saved through the Passover. Now it's a sanctification thing. I've kept you. I've, I've destroyed those who persecuted you after you were brought free, right? And you're here now at this mountain. And now that you're here at this mountain, here you go. This is, this is your responsibility. I will continue to be with you. I will continue to cover you. I will continue to provide for you. I will continue to be your, your shield, your buckler, your strong tower. All I need you to do is walk out this word. I need you to walk this word out because this word is going to teach you who I am again. This word is going to teach you how I am, who my nature is, who my character is. This word is not only going to teach you about me, it's going to teach you about your flesh. It's going to teach you about the very thing and the aspects of yourself that you need to let go so that way you can receive more grace to grow in my spirit and become like me and not like who you used to be. So you can be who... You can become who you really are and not who you thought you were. Because bondage and captivity has a way of producing an identity in you that is not you. Because Israel thought they were slaves. Even though they were in bondage to Egypt, they were never slaves. 
The father said that they were the apple of his eye. They were his chosen seed. In his eyes, they were royalty to him. They were precious to him. That's why he did what he did to deliver them the way he did. Right? But because of their place of captivity, they have forgotten who they were. So not only did he give them the scripture to remind them and teach them who he was, he is also reminding them, this is who you are. You are royalty. You are a peculiar people. Peculiar not meaning weird or strange. You are different than where you came from. You are different than what you thought you were. You got to stop thinking like a slave and understand that you are now a king because Christ is the king of kings. You are royalty. You have authority in this earth. But it's difficult to process all of that when we stay in bondage to the leaven that we were set free from. If that makes sense. All right. So going back through Matthew 23 and breaking it down. But before we transition to the last. Right. So. In Matthew chapter 23, verses 1 through 3, we kind of broke that down. All that's talking about is hypocrisy, right? They're hypocrites. They tell you this, and they don't do it themselves, right? They tell you this, and they don't do it themselves. That's why James 3 says what it says about being in a place of a teacher. If you're going to be in a place of a teacher, you better make sure you're, you're right. And what I mean right, I mean like you got to make sure... To the best of your ability, you're walking what you're preaching. Otherwise, you it, you receive a greater judgment on yourself because you're teaching, but you're not living it. You're a hypocrite in the eyes of the Father, and he deals with that accordingly, right? Right? But verse 4, For they bind heavy burdens and grievous to be born, and lay on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move one with their fingers. Right? So they they, they, they do it hypocritically, and they put a burden on, on other people, but they, want, they place condemnation in different things when they themselves want grace, right? They do all their works to be seen by men. That's pride, right? They got the big phylacteries, the large zizis. They got the, the big robes and all of this other stuff. They love the uppermost rooms at the feast, right? They want, they want the front row. They want to be. They want you to know who they are. When you see them, they want you to, to acknowledge them as, as, as the, the, the title that they occupy in different things like this, right? And then verses 9 through 12 basically breaks all that down and says, this is what they do, but that's not what you do, right? Verses 9 through 12, base 11 basically crushes all that and says, that's what they do, but that's not how I want you to do. That's the leaven I'm telling you to put off from yourself, right? Because all that is rooted in pride. And pride opens up the door to hypocrisy because now you feel like you got to maintain a certain image because, be, be, because you desire to be viewed a certain way. You desire to be viewed higher than you are, right? And so you're going to... Make sure that people don't see you in the light of who you really are because you want this image to maintain in their vision, right? He says, don't do that. That's what they do, right? And he tells you that who he that is great among you shall be your servant. In verse 12, he says, and whosoever shall exalt himself shall be humbled, and he that shall humble himself shall be exalted. All right? He that humbles himself shall be exalted. So he that is among you shall be a servant. So the more you mature in Christ, the more you grow in the most high, the stronger your spirit becomes, the more mature you become, the more responsible you become, the more obedient you become, the more you grow in servanthood. And there's a reason for that. Right? There's a reason for that. And the scriptures tell us things like you who are, you who are uh if a brother is someone amongst you, I'm paraphrasing right now, like if they're falling in sin and different things, like you who are spiritual, restore them in gentleness and meekness and different things like that. In other words, when you're mature, you come and you edify them. You encourage them. You strengthen them. I've been there before. This is, this is the way. This is how you do it. You encourage them and let them understand that though there, there, there are things that there's fruit to be born from sin and stuff like that, you encourage them to let them know it's not too late. They can return and continue in this path of sanctification. You pray for them. You minister to them, right? It's, it's a life of servitude. That's what minister means, to serve, right? So the more we grow in the Father, the more we serve others. And look at what Christ said when they dealt with fasting. He said, you know, they, they don't fast because I'm fasting. I'm here, right? But when I leave, they got to do it on their own. But the whole principle I'm highlighting there is the fact that he's like, because he was there, there's certain things he did on their behalf. So there's brothers and sisters around us every day that are struggling here and there, and they need prayer. The scriptures say the prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Intercede so that the Father can do what he needs to do. 
because they may be in a place where they may not they may not be strengthened strong enough to pray. They may be so heavy in the spirit that they can't bring themselves to pray. They might be distracted. They might be entangled with something where they can't pray. Or they might be doing something habitually in a way that their prayers are hindered. Right? So we walk in a certain light so that way we can bring that light to them. We can pray and intercede on their behalf and continue to help them grow. Right? So the more you grow, you don't grow in a posture where you put yourself at the pinnacle. You bring yourself lower so you can stay amongst the people and do the real work that needs to get done. If that makes sense, right? So, verses 13 through 18, right? So, 13 through 14, that's basically dealing with mammon, right? All about the money. They're, they're, they're basically getting rich off of those who are in need. Who the they, They're, I'll just say, misallocation of funds of the kingdom, if that makes sense. That's the easiest way I can explain that. And then verse 15, pretty much through... 18 is, is similar, right? 15 talks about, you know, them going to great lengths to, to make one convert, right? But the convert they just made, they basically they pretty much make them a reflection of who they are instead of training them how to be a reflection of the scriptures. So he says, you made them too far more the child of hell than yourselves. You basically taught them to walk in rebellion and disobedience as you did. And you have basically put them in a position that is worse than you, right? So he tells us, they do that, but you don't do that right that's leaven in the eyes of the father that's something that he's gonna that's something he doesn't deal with and that's something he will deal with but that's something that's something that that we don't do if that makes sense right and then it just everything else is pretty much the same thing and it all just breaks down to like the pride and the, and the, and the hip hypocrisy and basically make looking good on the outside with all the stuff on the inside that needs to be leaving leaving the stuff undone right so Moving forward, we're going to look at this aspect of what the Father says about pride. So in Ecclesiasticus chapter 10, verses 13 through 19, it says, For pride is the beginning of sin, and he that hath it shall pour out abomination, and therefore the Lord brought upon them strange calamities and overthrew them utterly, right? Say, he that exalted himself, the Lord will humble. Verse 14, The Lord had cast down the thrones of proud princes and set up the meek in their stead. The Lord has plucked up the roots of the proud nations and planted the lowly in their place. The Lord overthrew countries of the heathen and destroyed them to be the foundations of the earth. He took, excuse me, he took some of them away and destroyed them and hath made their memorial to cease from the earth. Verse 18. Pride was not made for men, nor furious anger for them that are born of a woman. 19. They that fear the Lord are a sure seed, and they that love him an honorable plant. They that regard not the law are a dishonorable seed. They that transgress the commandments are a deceivable seed. Right? So, we see here that the scripture says pride is the beginning of sin, right? And then if you cross-reference that, where, where you have the scripture about what, who, what many attribute to Lucifer says, you were perfect until iniquity was found in you. And when you break it down, the iniquity that was found in him was pride. Because if you really look at all sin, all sin starts with pride. Because all sin is disobedience. And the number one reason you disobey what the Father tells you is because you're, you're more concerned about yourself in that moment than you are Him. It's pride. And that's why He hates pride the way He does. Because it's the source of everything that is, that, that, that is, that is contrary to who He is. Because as prideful as the Father could be, I mean, He's not wrong when He says what He says about Himself. Right? But as, as great and, and powerful and omniscient as He is, he deals with little old you and me. Right? Dust. Made from dust. Our life is but a vapor. As great as he is, he deals with us. And the Messiah himself came and served us. Selfless. That's why the scriptures say, Greater love hath no man than this than to lay down his life for his friend. He says, See, I call you friends. The Most High God called Abraham friend, right? This all-powerful God of everything, and he called us mere humans friend. And then Christ came and served us. He served humans, right? The, you're talking about the Messiah, the Savior. That's the epitome of what it is we're supposed to be growing into. That selflessness, that sacrificial aspect of, of everything. Because that's the nature and the character of the Father. That's that unleavened bread that he's looking for. 
That's that that that's 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 the opposite of the leaven that we see in the doctrine of the scribes and the Pharisees, which is there to puff you up. The leaven of the the leaven of the Pharisees, the doctrine of the Pharisees, it puffs you up. It makes life all about you. The Bible teaches the direct opposite. It affirms who you are as a child through faith and authority and all these different things. But it gives us that understanding so we understand how we're supposed how we're supposed to operate in service to others. If that makes sense, right? So the leaven of heaven, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 8. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Right? So we serve the Father in spirit and truth. Right? That's that's to that's to serve without hypocrisy. Right? That's to serve without being walking in continuous willful sin. Right? We understand we continue to grow. And we know that there's times where we might fall short. But the point of saying that is just the reality that we don't make a habit of sinning. Right? We, we're striving to grow more and more like the Father. To become more and more Christ-like. Right? And we do this as we continue to deny ourselves and live a life of crucifixion daily. We bear more fruits of the Spirit as our flesh is laid to rest consistently. Right? And we do this all with purity of heart. And the concordance des uh, describes sincerity as cleanliness, right? Purity. So when he says we should keep it with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth, basically with the purity, right? The purity. The Father desires us to walk in purity, and purity by his standards and not the standards of what the world says is pure. Because of most of what the world says is pure is impure, right? All right, so... This is why the scriptures command us to walk circumspectly, right? And this is something that the Feast of Unleavened Bread helps us to do, right? You're inspecting what you eat. You're inspecting your house to see what needs to go so that way it can be pure. It can be clean, right? Ephesians 5, 11 through 21 says it like this. It says, And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. For it is a shame to even speak of these, those things which are done of them in the secret. But all things that are reproved are made manifest by the light, for whatsoever doth make manifest is light. Wherefore he saith, Awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. See that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. Wherefore, don't be unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. And be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. All right? So, it's a shame to even speak of those things which are done of them in secret. The reason why the verse says that is because when you really think about sin, sin is shameful. A lot of the stuff that we do when we're walking in sin is shameful. That's why we often try to hide it. But as we get more and more into a lawless society and the spirit of lawlessness emanates through the earth, there's less shame associated with sin. So people are now more unashamed of what the Bible says is shameful, right? But that's because the spirit of lawlessness is doing what it's supposed to do. It's producing more and more lawlessness. And the love of many is growing cold. Because there's because it's lawless. Right? But that's why Ecclesiasticus says what it says in verse 19. They that transgress the commandments are a deceivable seed. Right? Because it's there to show you. It's there to teach you. It's there to instruct you and protect you by showing you the way. Showing you what the will of the Father is. Showing you, uh, teaching you how to discern between good and evil. Teaching you how to understand what is pleasing and displeasing. Showing you what is honorable and dishonorable, right? The, 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 the scriptures that the Father has given us, it teaches us how to distinguish righteous from unrighteous, good from, un, from, from, from bad. Like stuff like that, if that makes sense, right? So when you understand this, then you can't be deceived when the enemy comes and tries to tell you that this thing that the Bible said is not good is actually good. It says, woe to those who call good evil and evil good. Because we've talked about it in the several lessons before, that's that's the language of Satan. He came to Eve and said, did God really say that? You're not really going to die. 
He he literally he basically told her that the very thing that the scripture said or that the father told her was a lie, and it wasn't gonna happen. He basically said, "I know what he said, but how it, what it means to me is this, right?" And Satan gave his interpretation of the word of God to Eve, and through that she was deceived. But had she yielded to what was told into her told to her. Then the scriptures wouldn't say what it said about even say where it says she was deceived, because she wouldn't have been deceived. I hope all of this is making sense, right? But this is the aspect and the concept we see happening because people are transgressing the commandment and going against the word, and 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 because the word of God is law, because we are going against the word, the spirit of lawlessness is abounding, and that which used to be shameful is no longer be is no longer being seen as shameful. And so it's starting to manifest and grow more and more and more prominent in the earth, right? But that's why in verse 15, he says, see that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. What is the beginning of wisdom? The fear of the most high God. Because the fool says in his heart, there is no God, right? And to make that very plain. There's a lot of different ways you can declare there is no God aside from just saying you don't believe in him. And that needs to be said because a lot of people feel like because they say they believe in a higher power or God or different things like that, they're not saying there is no God. No. You have to understand who the father is. You have to understand his, his, his code of ethics, his morals and all of that. Whenever you say that he's not who he says he is. And you don't even you don't have to verbally articulate it. Your lifestyle will show it. And your heart is 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 basically saying that th that he's not there. Right? When you live a lifestyle that shows that his word has no effect, right? It's the same as saying he's not there because he is his word. Right? So when we see the enemy attacking the word the way he does, when you start nit, uh, uh, cherry picking and, and showing partiality with what scriptures you apply to your life and different things like that, well, this was for them and that was for that, but this is for me. Ultimately, what you're doing is, is you're trying to tailor make the father. And when you start dealing with the word like that in your heart, you're saying there is no God because the Bible says that God is the word and the word is God. Right. So when you start distorting the word. You're, you're, you're distorting the perspective of who the, the reality of who the father is, not only for yourself, but for those who see you. Right. And the Bible says that's foolish. Because the beginning of wisdom, I mean, the beginning of, of wisdom is the fear of the most high. Right. And when you fear the most high. Right. Not like the terror. He's going to break my neck fear. When you respect, you honor, you reverence the reality of who he is for who he is. And you walk according to the scriptures. If that makes sense, right? Verse 16, redeeming the time because the days are evil. So verse 17, wherefore, don't be unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. Right? We learn that through the scripture. We learn that through being filled with the spirit. And then we encourage ourselves through what verses 19 through 21 says. All right? Moving forward. The, the word circumspectly is an adverb, and it means exactly circumspectly diligently or perfectly right so when he says walk circumspectly right is walk diligently be diligent to walk in obedience to what the father has told you to do as you grow don't don't get focused on what the next person is doing right and the reason why i say this because i see i see it with my sons all the time the older son knows what to do but sees the, the baby child doing different things and tries to minute make what the baby's doing for whatever. Like, I, I have my reasons why I think that is. But, I mean, just like, that's just baby stuff, right? But the point I'm trying to highlight is this. He knows better. But because he's comparing what he's doing and what his baby brother is doing and different things like that, ultimately what he's doing is he's basing how he's behaving based off of what he's seeing. Right. Around older children does the same thing. This is why this is important, especially when it deals with the body of Christ. 
You cannot base your obedience based off of what you see someone else doing. And what I mean when I say that, I want to bring this caveat because some people take that and they'll just say, well, I ain't got to do all that. I'm not talking about that. Right? If you see somebody that's 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 been walking this thing out and like they're walking in a path of sanctification and they're constantly growing and developing, that is something to pay attention to because it shows you it's possible, right? But don't go ahead of your growth as the, the most high is growing you and pursue that because you'll break yourself, right? Let the father grow you into those convictions, right? The main reason I'm saying that is because a lot of times I see a lot of believers who will look at younger believers or others who might not be as, as mature and they'll see them doing certain things that are not fully in line with scripture, if that makes sense. And because they see it and they feel like nothing is happening or whatever, then they themselves will do it. And that's not that's not proper. And the reason why I'm saying that is because you understand where the father gives you understanding of where you are in your growth season. Don't regress. He wants you to progress, not regress. So don't don't look at you. That's why you can't look at who's around you and base your walk off of that. What do the scriptures say? What are those areas that the father is cleaning? What are those leaven? What is that leaven in your life that the father is cleaning up and dealing with? Let him deal with that and continue to grow at your own pace. Right. Whatever he's given you to do, be diligent with it. That can be anything. That could be your language. That could be what you're listening to, what you're watching. It could be anything. Right? And I was because I was explaining this to my wife earlier. Like, for a fact, I know one thing that the most high did with through um in me through his Holy Spirit was clean my language. Cause I used to like like every other word, in bombs, cuss words, all kind of stuff. And when the father was cleaning this temple out. When, when, when Christ came and, and this body became his temple instead of mine, one of those things he cleaned up was my language. And I know it was him because how, how filthy and profane my language used to be, right? Like we, it's, we call it cuss words and stuff like that, but curse words are different. Like curse words deal like literally with sorcery. It's, it's profanity. Profanity is, is the result of a profane heart, right? So as the father begins to deal with your heart, that profane language that we've been conditioned to feel is okay by the world, the Holy Spirit will begin to cleanse it and change it. Your language and your conversation will change. Right? And I'm saying that because, like, as it's, I know it's possible, but I'm just saying it's an example so that way you can understand how the, how the Spirit works, right? There's certain areas 11 in each and every one of our lives that He'll deal with. And it's been, like, several years since, since like, you know, like my language just changed, and I it was like a month before I was like I was like man I ain't cussed in a long time or you know what I'm saying so it's like different things like that it shows it's the work of the spirit right but I'm I'm just showing that to encourage like just just trust right now the last thing we're gonna get into is this aspect of examining yourself and I think it kind of deals with where we were just going right so Second Corinthians chapter thirteen verses five through thirteen it says examine yourselves whether you be of the faith. Prove your own selves. Know you not your own selves how that Christ is in you, except you be reprobates. But I trust that you will know that we are not reprobates. Now I pray to God that you do not do evil. Not that we should appear approved, but that you should do that which is honest, though we be as reprobates. For we can do nothing against the truth, but for the truth. For we are glad when we are weak and you are strong. And this also that we wish, even your perfection. Therefore, I write these things being absent, lest being present, I should use sharpness according to the power which the Lord has given me to edification and not to destruction. Finally, brethren, farewell. Be perfect. Be of good comfort. Be of one mind. Live in peace. And the God of love and peace shall be with you. Greet one another with a holy kiss. All the saints salute you. Right? So we have this concept of examining ourselves, and my prayer is that as we've been talking throughout this whole lesson, that like that's one of the things that you've been hearing from the Spirit, like this concept of examining yourself, right? Examining yourself. This this whole entire week in this in this feast is to, is just to reinforce that concept of examining yourself, and to train us and teach us how to examine. Examine yourself. Examine your surroundings. Examine your environment. 
Examine what you participate in. Examine what you consume spiritually, naturally. Right? Examine the word. Examine. Right? Prove it. That's one thing that made the Bereans noble. They they listened to what was said and they went back and they proved it through the scriptures. Right? That's an example with the word. But examine your own life. Examine your own walk. Where are those areas of hidden sin? What, what are those areas that you know you've been convicted of, but you continue to hold on to it? What are those areas you know you've been walking in pride about, but you refuse to confront it? What are those areas in your life that the Father has said needs to change, but you refuse to change it? Right? That's the leaven of heaven. Right? Or excuse me, that's what the leaven of heaven is intended to replace. But you got to get rid of the old leaven so the new leaven can come in. It's comparable with the scripture. You can't put the new wine into the old wine skin. Right? You got to get rid of the old leaven.